Hey guys, Khalid from Cricket Fanatics Magazine here, and I'm here with Aaron from the Cricket Connoisseur. So, first of all, I just want you guys, yeah, I want Aaron to actually introduce himself to you guys. He's a new guy, new platform, and I just want him to introduce himself and explain his platform to you. So, go ahead, Aaron. <laughs> Thank you very much, Khalid. So, hello, everyone. I'm Aaron. I'm from the platform The Cricket Connoisseur. It's a very rapidly growing Instagram page. I cover cricket from all across the world, international, domestic. You name the country, I will have covered cricket from it. So today, I believe we are just going to discuss the South African innings from day one of the South Africa versus England Test match. This is a four-match series in the ICC World Test Championship. Both sides desperately need points. We need to catch India and Australia. So take it away, Khaled. Let's get into this. Cool, cool, cool. So first of all, let me just take you off on the side path quickly and ask you what... Because you obviously cover a lot of cricket from all around the world, what is your impression about the standard of cricket in South Africa? To be honest, I think the standard's there. Yeah, I think it always has been. The only issue for me is the domestic setup. And it's something mm. that I have had a problem with for a while, the whole quota system, the lack of players actually going on to play for South Africa. With the cold pack system, that's been a massive thing. It's been massively exaggerated in the past year, especially with guys like Short, uh, Carl Abbott's. Wally Rousseau, Simon Harmer, mm -hmm. they're all going abroad. They're guys that South Africa really could have done with using in the India series, for example. So I think the talent's there. And I like the fact that in this series, Rassi van der Dusen's come up, Dame Patterson, Rui Second, guys like that. And also Zubai Hamza, love that he's getting a chance. He deserves to cement his position at number three. So I think the talent's there. The issue is the whole six franchise system, it hasn't really worked. There's been a lot of problems with it. We all know about the problems with the quota system that players might not necessarily get picked on merit, but, well, because of ethnicity. So I do think that the talent's there. Now it's all about Graham Smith, Mark Boucher, Jacques Fall as the CEO to kind of oversee operations mm -hmm. and just really bring South African cricket back to where it belongs. So if they can almost, I don't know, go back to provinces, something like that, almost mm -hmm. adopt, not a county setup, but a state setup, I think that is the first step in really progressing into South Africa's future. So, luckily enough, we are going to be doing that. There's massive talks about us going into 12 provinces. So, that's yep. going to obviously, for me, from my point of view, that will increase the standard of cricket in South Africa because there will be more people filtering down into club cricket if they still want to play cricket professionally. So, if the club cricket format in South Africa can increase, more sponsors get involved with that because now higher profile players are going to be playing there. My opinion is that it kind of will increase automatically all the, the levels. With regards to transformation and the quota system, etc., my point of view is that it needs to be done at grassroots level. Um, at, at school level and grassroots level, that's where it needs to be a little bit more strict so that we can develop more people and give them chances to get signed up on massive schools. Because if you look in South Africa, it's quite an elite sport, cricket. Um, it's quite an expensive sport to play. So a lot of the people from the township need to be sponsored or need to get a bursary or need to get some help or aid or financial aid to be able to play the sport. Um, at the school level, because, I mean, you need to get a bursary. I mean, our schools over here are quite expensive for people from disadvantaged backgrounds to actually go to. So the only way they can actually get the site or the recognition they need or play in a great facilities is to be able to get a bursary at a top school or, to, or if they can afford it out of their pocket. So I think there a lot of work needs to be done there. Obviously, South Africa is trying to... I like the setup at the moment with regards to Ashwell Prince, who is as a good eye for young talent. You can see by his Cobra side last season, a lot of yep. young players, um, Carl Verneen is coming through that system. There's Jason Smith, David Beddingham. You've got a guy like Super Ramza that came through his hands. So he's the SAA coach. So he has a great eye for young talent. So he's kind of the stepping stone between domestic cricket and obviously Proteus cricket. So hopefully that can sort out a lot of our problems and he can communicate and have a great relationship with the Rock Boucher. But let's talk about England because, I mean, I feel that Kind of after the World Cup, your coach left and now you have a new coach who was previously your bowling coach and now he's now yep. currently your, your, your coach. Are you guys in a similar position or are you nearing a similar, a similar kind of position that South Africa's in? No, uh, I don't know. I don't think that England have reached that kind of crisis or breaking point that South mm. Africa almost did. And we still are yet to see if they can get out of that. Hopefully they can. I really do hope that they will. But with England at the moment, it is very much a rebuild process. We've got a new coach. We've got young guys coming in, the likes of Dom Sibley, Zach Crawley, Joffre Archer, guys like that. The only issue is now we have got an ageing team. 
we aren't like the West Indies who are bringing in young talent left, right and centre. And yes, maybe they're not going to get results straight away, but they will in the future. Now, for me, I don't think the county system is an issue. I think the county setup is generating quality cricket talent. Mm -hmm. The issue is we aren't really giving young guys a, talent, a, a go. And this is absolutely stress on Twitter because when Dom Sibley, he's just got out for four in this test match, everyone's calling for his head. In wow. England, we just don't give young guys an opportunity. We give them about four or five test matches and then, right, if you're not averaging 50, you're gone. So I think that needs to change straight away in terms of our fan mindset. Mm. In terms of the way in which we're actually going about things, I think we do need to kind of just invest in youth now because the likes of Anderson, Braws, even Root, for example, the guys that in less than a decade, they're going to be gone. They're going to be retired. Look at the hole that Alistair Cook left in the team. Mm, yes. So, I don't know. For me, I know there's people talking, I mean, James Hildreth, he's someone from Somerset, an excellent player. He got the most runs in the county championship this decade. But I don't really want us going back to guys who are 30 plus. I think there's a lot of young talent, the likes of Matt Parkinson, Pat Brown, to keep a mood. Guys like that, they are coming up through the system. Don Bess as well, who's currently in the series side. So, I'd hope that we adopt that route. I don't want instant success. I want a long-term solution to this problem. But whether or not we as England fans will accept that is a completely different thing. It's a similar, but, um, model. It's a similar model that I'd like South Africa to actually take. Because, I mean, I have a massive problem with... Even though I think that Rudy Second is a great player, great wicketkeeper batsman, he's, he's, done his due, he's done his work in domestic cricket and he's done really well there. I feel that we need to build, because it's a test championship that runs over two years, why not build a team for the next test championship? South Africa's chances, yeah. I feel, in this test championship to win it is highly unlikely with the, the problems that's happening over there. It's kind of a rebuilding phase. So I feel like if they had to give a guy like Tal Verena, who has this massive, massive mental capacity, amazing mental strength, he showed it time and time again that he has this BMT. He can come in into a crisis situation and pull teams out of it. He's done it with the Cobras, he's done it with the Cape Town Blitz when he was there last season and this season with the Power Box he's done the same oh, yeah. thing. So like he, that, that natural mental capacity and mental strength you can't teach or coach. So players like that we need to put in when they to learn from the best players and to give a guy that's 30 or 40 or 30 or 35 or 33 a chance at so late in his career is it really worth it? I'm not really sure. So I'm more after giving the young guys a chance. So I agree with you 100% on that structure. But okay, so let's move on to the crux of this video, which is the, the test match and the Boxing yep. Day test match. It was, I mean, there was a lot of hype around this test. And for South Africa, it's a massive, massive opportunity for us to actually show the fans and show the community that we are back in a way, in a sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. that first innings, it hasn't shown that we have really gotten out of that. Um, those problems that we have, I mean, our batting has been an issue for quite some time now. We saw it in the Sri Lanka series when we went to Sri Lanka against India as well. Even in those series that we won here, if it wasn't for one or two individual performances against Australia and against um, India when they came down to South Africa, I don't think we would have won those series um, if it wasn't for one or two great performances. I mean, I'm, I missed the times when three or four batsmen were are performing, like, at, at some of the times, there were times when Graham Smith, Jock Callis, and Abra Villas all scored centuries in the same game. I mean, it's, that's the type of that level that I want to get to. And you can see by South Africa, all soft dismissals. Um, Dean Algo in the first, in the yeah, first ball soft. of the game, very soft dismissal. <laughs> I mean, Aidan Markham hitting it to mid wicket. I mean, it was, it was really, really. And even Zubair Ramza, he was looking solid for that 39. He played some great yeah, and then he, he pushed. And he pushed. Push um, the same thing with Fatu Plessis. We need a guy like him to step up. Passive on the distance, struggling in his opening test. I mean, we, we need a Quentin the Cock to really get us out of trouble. And so what yeah. is your opinion on South Africa's first innings? It was a very mixed bag. <laughs> That's what I'd say. So in terms of Quentin de Cock, I'll start with the positives. Magnificent. 95 looked in incredibly assured in his game. Played some beautiful shots in there. Had some very good stroke play as well. Rotated the strike intelligently as well towards the end of his innings. But the issue was the dismissals. I don't particularly think that England were at their best yesterday in terms of the way in which they were mm. seeming the ball. We weren't really generating the movement that, let's say, Rabada is now or Philander are. So I don't think England really did deserve some of those wickets, especially a lot of Dean Elgar one. That was a very strange one for me. 
But in terms of the way that South Africa went, at, it, at least they showed a bit of fight. And that's something that I don't think they showed enough of in the India series, but they did in this one. And in terms of England's bowling attack, yes, we weren't brilliant. At times we were. Sam Curran was fantastic. Figures of 458. Stuart Broad as well, 458. Very similar uh, figures there from those two. But other than that, Jimmy, he looked a bit, I don't know, looks a bit rusty. He hasn't played cricket since, I believe, the 4th of August. So that's been a long time. And then Joffre, well, that was well documented yesterday. Did have his struggles. I'm watching Rabard charging this morning. He's constantly hitting that 89, 91 mile an hour mark. Mm. And that's kind of putting England under a lot of pressure. Whereas Archer yesterday was bowling that for about his first seven overs and then it just dropped to about 84. So that's about consistent. We see with Jofra, that's something that we need. And that's something that South Africa will generate in this next innings. The likes of Anrik Norkia, they've got Kiso Rabada, as I was just saying, they have Vernon Falans kind of just cement that position for them. We can get a bit of movement in there, test the edges. So in terms of the first innings, as I said, I don't really know what to make of it, honestly. Yeah. I think that... It was a decent first effort from South Africa. They did get a decent amount of runs. They're putting England under a lot of pressure now. But in terms of the way in which they batted, just sometimes you've got to be mentally strong enough to kind of dig in, not throw your hands at the ball, know where the position of the fielders are. And I think that's something that South Africa didn't really do enough of yesterday. I felt like they were very much chasing runs instead of just taking the time, accumulating the runs at a steady rate. And realistically, other than De Kock and Zubaya Hamza, I thought he looked very good until his dismissal. I think those two were the only ones really applying that principle yesterday. So I'm obviously hoping that someone like Jacques Callas can come in here and make an impact. Um, it's obviously not going to be instant. I know a lot of people are going to start calling for heads and start saying, oh, but I'll be <laughs> fair, we have Jacques Callas in. I mean, people are right to jump to conclusions very quickly. But I think Jacques Callas' ability to be able to... There was, a, there was a particular book that I read about Jacques Callas where he speaks about... They spoke about him and his bubble technique where he puts himself into a bubble and doesn't allow anybody to enter that bubble when he's batting at the crease. And I thought that was an amazing analogy to use because I think that's the type of mental techniques and mental um, capabilities that he needs to, to teach our youngsters. So like guys like Aidan Markham have amazing potential and talent. Yes. If they can learn that from him, I mean, in time, you can see... My problem with Aiden at the moment, I'm a big fan of Aiden, but the, the problem with Aiden at the moment is that he feels like almost like he's, he's rushing his innings or rushing his strokes. Yes, he does definitely. It, it's almost like he's not realizing it's test cricket. You've got a whole day to bat. Just take your time, rather leave a few balls. Hamza showed that very well. He left a few good balls and took his time yep. at the crease. I don't know why he would play the stroke that he did when he got dismissed, but sometimes there's a lapse in concentration. But I think that um, a guy like Carlos over time, throughout the series, I think South Africa's batting will improve with his appointment. Also with, obviously, Mark Boucher understanding that because he was quite a tough mental guy as well. Yeah, very, um, very. <laughs> but there was a point that you made there, and I really want to ask your opinion on that, is that about Joffrey Archer. So when Joffrey Archer yep. came into the test scene, he was bowling one, close to 150 consistently. Yeah. Like, really hitting 91, 92 miles per hour, almost like 90 miles per hour consistently. So what is the... The reason do you think that he's, he was so much slower? I mean, I saw him bowling a lot of balls in the 143 kilometer per hour zone more than, mm. than closer to 150. Well, in terms of that, potentially it's fatigue. But Joffrey has played a lot of cricket this year. Mm. Obviously, the Ashes, it's a massive, massive uh, stamina drain that. But I don't know. I think it's also the mindset. And I don't think Joe Root has particularly used Joffrey Archer that well. I think in the New Zealand series, we're using him far too much with the new ball. And for me, he's not a new ball bowler. Mm. I think he keep it with Broad and Anderson because they can generate the lateral C movements, whereas Archer's very much your express pacer. Now, in terms of his speed, maybe it is fatigue. But at the same time, I honestly can't really put a finger on it, to be honest, because I've been watching Joffre for quite a few years now for Sussex. He's always got that express pace. He is that little clinical edge that England need in these kind of series in Australia, South Africa, countries with very good pitches. So whether it's a mental thing for Joffre, whether his body actually can't do it. Now, remember, England have had an illness. Joffre was affected by that. That could explain it. Mm -hmm. That's, it's not going to explain why he didn't generate those speeds in New Zealand. But maybe it is a reason for why he didn't generate it in this test match. Now, whether or not he'll actually, I don't know, build up those 90 mile an hour plus speeds again, honestly don't know. I think it's very much mental for Joffre. He knows he can do it. Maybe there's something slightly out of sync in his bowling technique that's kind of throwing him off, reducing the pace. But, mate, honestly, I can't put my finger on it. 
because mm. you look at the likes of Brett Lee, Sherbaktar, real express pacers, and they were always consistent. They never had these games where they suddenly tailed off to 80, yeah. 83 mile an hour. They were always coming in, charging in as if it was their last ever test game and they needed to take wickets for their country. And whether that's something that Joffre hasn't really become accustomed to yet, he is very young, has got a bit of an ego. He's 22 and from Barbados. It's the West Indian way, isn't it? We all know about egos. He's been achieving throughout his career. Brilliant for Rajasthan, brilliant for Hobart in the Big Bash. Got success with Surrey, not Surrey, with Sussex as well. Got them to two, three, 20 plus finals days. And he's also very good in the county championship. So whether this is now a period of adversity for him and he's struggling to deal with it, potentially that might be why his, his speeds are dropping. That's the only way in which he can kind of find his way out of this. But for me, I think he has to get his confidence back, get the speeds up, and he'll start taking wickets again because he's not, he's not a bowler of variation. He's not a Vernon Philander. He's not, I don't know, well, in England's case, Jimmy Anderson, who can kind of generate that extra bit of movement with the ball. So, as I said, confidence and probably a bit of working on the technique as well for me. I think that's a lesson that both South Africa and England can learn is how to manage bowlers because there was a massive talk around Kahi Sorabada as well. He was hitting that close to 150 mark consistently at the beginning of his career and he's kind of fallen along the wayside with regards to that because, I mean, his speed has decreased. But the amount of cricket that Kahi Sorabada plays is ridiculous. All formats, yeah. T20 cricket, IPL, straight into test matches. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable that they, they overplay him like that. And he's still also young. So... I'm hoping that they can learn from this now and give Kaigaji some rest so that they can recoup and, and work on his um, rhythm again because, I mean, uh, we're missing now the spells at the moment because uh, we ha we're having this conversation at the moment. So I haven't really seen the speeds that he's been bowling today. He has been, he has been bowling well. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> yeah, maybe with a little bit of rest, he may be able to pick up his speed again and get to that piece of battle that we all know. I'll tell you something else, Khaled. And this is something that I've only just thought of. Because you mentioned it was at the start of his career. Now, potentially, that is attitude. Joffre came in, and he had to hit those speeds exactly right in his first ever series for England to kind of cement his place. Now, it might be a bit of, I don't know, almost lackadaisical nature. He knows he's got his, his place in the team. Rabada is exactly the same. Potentially, there's not the pressures. Potentially, they're kind of just falling off the boil a bit. Maybe that's why the speed isn't up there. They're thinking, oh, right, okay, we're in the team. doesn't really matter. We don't really need to hit those 90-plus mile-an-hour speeds because we're going to be selected anyway. As I said, it's probably just the mindset of that because when you're a new player, you have to generate something else, which kind of is your unique factor that you bring to the team. And whether that was pace for them both, I think it was. Rabada was extremely quick. Joffre was very quick as well. And I think that is probably what's just missing now. They need to get that attitude back of, there's pressure on you, someone will take your place. And if you don't perform to your best, then we will probably drop you out of the team. So how much do you think T20 cricket has to do with that? Because my, my opinion is that because in T20 cricket they have to learn, how, because they only get four overs, they need to learn how to bowl variations, slow deliveries, yes. etc. And all of these other type of deliveries that they don't usually have to bowl in test cricket. So then when they switch formats and they try to bowl in test cricket, it's almost like that has really been worked into them. And do you think that maybe in this day and age, in this style of test cricket, test cricket is also quickened up, but it's getting a lot faster and a lot quicker. People are playing a lot faster innings. They're not taking their time as much as the crease as before, as we used to see it. Um, you got your few players like maybe... Um, Dean Algo that stays there for 300 balls at the crease for a century. But um, a lot more people are scoring a lot quicker. Do you think that maybe because of the fact that these bowlers think that maybe variations are more important than actually a high speed, that that's why it's maybe dropping? Potentially. I do think that. I think that was a very good point about the, the test game is definitely quickening. We know it is. Gone are the days of Jeffrey Boycott taking two days off of batting. Okay. <laughs> So the game has evolved in that way. Strike rates have gone up. Averages have gone down. That's how test cricket is going at the moment. It's a trend that doesn't seem to be booking. Now, in terms of the variation point, of course, we're seeing lots of variations. I've seen players in test matches now bowling knuckleballs, which is something that <laughs> we would never have seen in the early 2000s. The game is evolving to that point, And maybe that's why averages are going down if you're facing a seeming banana ball at 90 mile an hour. But at the same time, of course, it does affect the test game. The fact is, these guys, with the variations, you're lacking consistent line and length. That's the whole point of it. They're not really testing the edges to how you're used to. The likes of Jimmy Anderson is a perfect example of this. 
Vernon Philander as well for South Africa. You look at the likes of, oh, I don't know, it would be another medium, a Colin de Grandom, mm. for example. They come in, they hit consistent line and length, and they make the batsman make the mistake. Yeah. Now, at the moment, that isn't really happening in test cricket. The likes of your archers, your express pacers, coming in, bowling, slower change-ups, stuff like that, and that isn't what's needed. You need to go in, charge in quick as possible, hit your line in length, and the batsman will play. They'll edge it, they'll nick it, something like that, and they'll get out. And that is a key mindset to having test cricket. So I did think that was an excellent point. It really is. Because when you think about it, the best bowlers in test cricket are the ones who don't need the variations. They're skilled enough to swing the ball. That's pretty much all you need. An in-swinger, an out-swinger, potentially a bit of reverse swing if you're, if you're Kahiso or Zahir Khan, someone like that. So definitely, I think that is shaping the test game. And I think that's a wonderful point that you've made there, definitely. Okay, obviously we want to go get, get back to the test and watch yeah, some action again. But um, I want to talk about one more topic. And it's a, it's a topic that I think that both England and South Africa are going to face. And it's the... My, from my point of view, from South Africa's point of view, it is the question about Quinton de Kock. Now, Quinton yes. de Kock, in my eyes, is the best batsman in the South African team at the moment. Most informed, most talented, most everything. He has a, he's a full package as a batsman. I have an assumption or I have an opinion that he could bat in the number four position. Now, generally speaking, in world cricket, we have all the best batsmen are batting in the top number three, number four, majority of the time, Steve Smith, Bird of Coley, um, Kane Williamson, all of these guys are batting. The best batsmen are batting in that number four position. For me, from a technical point of view, and because I've spoken to the keepers that have worked with Quinton and have worked with Kyle Verena, there's a large um, amount of people that think, that, that say that from a, from a wicket keeping point of view, that Kyle Verena is a more technically talented wicket keeper than yep. Quinton the Cock. Because, for example, people, I think fans get um, drawn in by the, the fancy stuff, the flashy things, like the dives and the big dives and all, yeah. of those type of, all those type of things. Whereas in test cricket, if you're doing your, your job correctly, you wouldn't need to dive. If your, no, foot that's is good, if your footwork is quick enough, if, you, if you're aware of where to stand and position yourself, and according to your bowlers, you wouldn't need to dive crazily and consistently. Quinton is a great keeper. And I think he's been our best keeper for the last few years. But I think his batting ability is batting and his keeping ability. And if South Africa yes. can put that number four position and keep Quinton in that position, we have a chance to give a guy like Alvarena a shot to be the keeper at the number six position because he has shown that he can also marshal a tail. Yeah. Or the same thing with regards to you guys, I feel, with Johnny Besto, where Johnny Besto is he good enough to be a batsman in the side, and not just for his keeping ability. So I feel yeah. like, what, do you, do you, how do you feel on that topic and with regards to Johnny Besto and obviously, of course, with the top? Well, this is where there is definitely a similarity with England and South Africa. As you just mentioned, Carl Verena, excellent, excellent wicketkeeper. And I think that is something that South Africa might experiment with once Faf, do, please, once Faf does retire. Because then they can move him up into that position and they'll put in a specialist wicketkeeper. Now, the similarity with England is the whole thing about Bairstow, Butler and Ben Folkes. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, and I've thought this for a very long time, Ben Folkes is the most technically gifted wicketkeeper in England. He's magnificent. He's been excellent for Surrey for a number of years now. Very, very talented wicketkeeper. And I think he's probably the best glove man in the team. But in terms of Johnny Bairstow, because he is the wicketkeeper, that cements his position. And if we could put Ben Folkes in there, I think that would be the better option. And then you can move up a guy like Butler. I know we have Stokes anyway, but I don't know, once Joe Denley retires, for example, we can move him up the order, have Rue at three, something like that, just experiment with it a bit. Now, I, it's a tough one for me because Ben Folkes as a batsman isn't as good as Johnny Bairstow. Mm. I think we know that he wasn't in form. And as you can say with South Africa, it would be a very, very big risk because Carl Verain hasn't had that test experience yet. He hasn't been in the test arena, hasn't faced 90 plus mile an hour quick bowlers coming in, pouncing him short and then following up with a Yorker. So, I don't know. I think it's very experimental for both sides. I would like to see it in both sides, especially with Carl Verain, as you mentioned. I think he's very good. Also, um, Sinatemba Kashile, yeah. very good young keeper batsman from South Africa. I'd also like to see him, maybe in the future, maybe not yet. He is a bit young yeah. for me. But I'd like to see him kind of transition his way into the side as well. 
just as I'd like to see England, I don't know, experiment, bring them folks in and then almost shift the batting order. Because at the moment, this just isn't working. We aren't getting the batting scores either. We collapsed against the West Indies earlier on this year. The Ashes, yes, we had Ben Stokes. I think that was very much papering over the cracks. The batting order just doesn't seem to have been cemented yet. I don't think they're really, they're really confident in their abilities as of yet. So in terms of both teams, expand with it, shake it up once these retirements do happen. I think that is the way to go forward in the future. And there's no harm in trying because the fact is they are talented guys. They deserve an opportunity in the team and hopefully it will pay off for both of our respective nations. Cool. Thanks a lot. And that was a great conversation. And I'm looking forward to our next one. I just want to give yep. you some, some air time just to punch some of your social media platforms so you can go ahead. <laughs> Perfect. So, yes, as I said, well, well back in the introduction, on my Instagram page, it's the cricket connoisseur underscore, or you can put in hashtag TCCMNP on Instagram. It'll come up on my page. I do daily match summaries, daily live streams, analysis as well. If you can't tell already, I absolutely love the game. I cover it all across the world, get the opportunity to talk with fans such as Khalid who share this real love and passion for the game. So if you could check me out, please feel free to. Also check out Cricket Fanatics on their social media because they've been incredibly good to me. I like all of them. They've been absolutely fantastic to me. I'm excited to work with them a lot more. And uh, yes, thanks for checking me out, guys. Thanks, guys. So you know what to do. Like, share, comment and subscribe to our channel. Um, and we'll see, catch up with Adam after the England innings. So thanks, thanks, Brew, and I'll chat to you again. <laughs> yeah, perfect, Kelly. Thank you very much. Thank you.